Good afternoon, IFCBA members, and welcome to today's webinar, sponsored and presented by HL, HLB Manjad. I'd like to introduce and welcome Mariana von Lucan, Bill Nosbaum, and Steve Grivas, who will be presenting uh, this session on end of year tax tips. So on that note, I'd like to hand over to you, Steve. Thank you. Thank you, Taris. Um, welcome everyone. Um, thank you for joining this webinar. My name is Steve Grievous and I'm an Audit and Corporate Advisory Partner at HLB Man Judd, as well as the Head of Freight Forwarding Services and your host for, for this session. Today we are presenting end of year tax tips for IFCBA members, presented by our panel of experts, tax consulting partner Mariana von Lucan and Director Bill Nussbaum. Without further ado, I'll pass over to, to Bill. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, welcome. Um, so I thought we would kick off and discuss the agenda. Um, these are the items we'll be discussing today. <clears throat> I'll be talking about year-end planning ideas. Uh, Mariana will then talk about uh, the 2000, some of the 2021 budget announcement and also some key tax considerations that can benefit your business. Um, then I'll come back and talk about employer considerations. And I'll also talk about some individual considerations as well. So just some year-end planning ideas. So really year-end planning, I suppose has two main, two main focuses, generally has two main focuses. The first one being reducing or deferring income. Uh, and the second focus is obviously on increasing or accelerating allowable deductions and tax offsets. Deferring assessable income. I thought before we start on that, one thing that I, that I like to do before year end, a really important tax planning tool is to review the management accounts uh, up to say 31st of May. This sort of enables you, know, you to assess the company's operating profit position prior to year end and sort of planning can then be undertaken to look at various ways to reduce the company's profit. <clears throat> we find this a valuable tool to engage with a client prior to year end and discuss various planning options available. Also, just a little bit going away a little bit from tax, it's, it's also a good time to sit down and plan out maybe a strategy for the next 12 months. Uh, some issues you want to consider, including maybe organizing a planning session for your team, you know, to sort of to paint a picture of where the business should be. Um, you, you may want to use even an outside consultant to assist. Um, you might want to work out sort of strategies to best suit the business for the next 12 months. And also maybe prepare a financial budget. Um, so in terms of deferring income, I mean, obviously there's not many things you can do, but the, ma the main thing is obviously look at possibly deferring invoicing, especially around the 30th of June cutoff date. And, and, and of course, depending on the company's profit position, um, you know, you may want to consider deferring an invoice for your service, for the freight forwarding services until after June, 30th of June, if that's possible. For example, if you have a particular job that has been finalized around 30th of June, uh, you may you know, consider deferring the jobs invoicing until you know, after 30th of June. <clears throat> also, if there are any sort of, if the business has any cash term deposits, uh, you may wanna try and organize maturity to occur after 30th of June. Um, Interest is generally only accessible when the term deposit matures and is you know, credited to the account. <clears throat> okay, so with the de with deductions, <clears throat> um, yeah, there's a few there's a few chestnuts here, um, but I, but I think it's still important to consider them, you know, prior to year end. Um, obviously, salaries, you know, ensure that they're all paid, you know, by 30th of June. Uh, bonuses. Um, now with bonuses, especially if you pay staff bonuses, 
you know, after 30th of June, um, you know, there, there really has to be a definite commitment to pay the bonus amount, you know, before 30th of June for the bonus to be tax deductible in the 21 year. So if you just, if you just accrue an amount, a general accrual, that won't be deductible. Um, so the, and the bonuses also need to be quantified and documented in a director's resolution prior to year end. And, and that's an important area because the tax office does look at that area. Um, similar to director's fees, um, director's fees are similar to bonuses. You know, they should be approved by the directors prior to year end. Um, and again, there must be a definite commitment for the director's fees to be paid prior to year end. Um, FBT, especially the June quarter instalment, um, that June quarter instalment is normally paid in July, um, but the ATO uh, does give a, a tax deduction, allow a tax deduction for that instalment. So that's something to just take into account when you're doing your tax calculation. Uh, and superannuation, again, that's yeah, that really covers the June quarter super guarantee payment. Again, that's due on the 28th of July, but if you want to secure a deduction in the current year, that needs to be paid by 30th of June. Um, personal concessional super contributions also need to be made you know, before 30th of June, um, but I'll discuss super you know, a little bit later in the presentation. Hmm. A few more deductions, um, possible deductions, prepayments is the first one. Um, and, and this is quite an important one. So where a business has turnover less than 50 million, uh, it can prepay certain expenses like rent on the business premises for up to 12 months. And if this prepayment's made say in June, 21, you can claim a tax deduction for the full amount of the, of the payment. Um, other examples of prepayments include insurance premiums, uh, interest on business bank loans, lease payments. Uh, so all these uh, could, be, could be deductible, uh, even though they're you know, paying in 12 months time for, for 12 months worth of services. <clears throat> um, the other the other chestnut, of course, is repairs and maintenance. You know, try and ensure that's done before 30th of June. You know, if possible, bring forward any repairs and maintenance that needs to be done. <clears throat> um, the other one is uh, consumables, things like office supplies and stationery. You know, try and buy as you know, try and buy those before 30th of June as well. And the other big one is, of course, purchasing of assets. Um, to take advantage of the various temporary full expensing rules, which uh, Mariana will discuss uh, in more detail soon. Again, another old chestnut, um, you know, review the fixed asset schedule and, and scrap any, any assets that are no longer on hand. Um, trade debtors, you know, review debtors and write off any unrecoverable debts, you know, the debt under tax law must be physically written off before year end, you know, and, and circumstances, you know, could be for a bad debt where a debtor can't be traced or, or a debtor might be in liquidation or receivership, or there's really little or, or no likelihood of the uh, debt being recovered. Just, I thought I'd briefly touch on the accessibility of some of the COVID related payments. Um, so firstly, the cash flow boost, uh, a lot of members I'm sure have received that during the year. So that is non-accessible to the company, um, which is great, of course. Um, however, you know, there's a warning there and that's really more in the future if you decide, the company decides to pay that as a dividend out to a shareholder, um, then, you know, they're, they're, because there's no tax being paid, there may not be enough franking credits uh, to attach to the to the uh, dividend, so the dividend will be fully taxable. Um, the job keeper payment, um, again, that's accessible income. Um, 
the job maker hiring credit, which I'll talk about a little bit later, um, which is not as, as common, um, that's also accessible. Um, and also the early release of super on COVID related grounds, that is non-accessible. Non <clears throat> anyway, so now I'll maybe hand over to Mariana and she'll discuss some of the uh, budget changes and other key tax considerations. <clears throat> Thanks, Bill. Um, welcome, everyone. And um, I just wanted to talk about and remind everyone um, that uh, we do have a sort of two tax rates running at the moment, uh, which is always quite interesting. Uh, so, you know, if you're one of these large entities, turnover, aggregated turnover over 50 million, and you're going, what does that mean? Uh, basically, you're an Australian entity and you look at all your entities that are attached to you. And if you're controlled by an overseas entity, controlled usually, you know you're 100% owned, 50% or 40% owned, um, you include their income as well. So if your turnover is over 50 million, then you're 30 cents in the dollar. Okay, and that's the tax you pay in Australia. If um, you're under that 50 million, then you get these other rates. So this is what I'm talking about on this slide here, the lower corporate tax rates. Um, so if you're not at 30%, you could be something else. And what the government did in their wisdom is decided that they, they'd like to scale it. So, you know, it started it, they brought it down to 27 and a half. And then this financial year, so 30th of June, 2021, always becomes difficult when you've got a substitute accounting period, but in June, it's 26%. And next year, it'll go to 25%. And, and so for some of those family, probably more family owned where they control the business and they want to pay out some dividends, uh, what we have said in the past before the tax rate goes down is, is to be careful that uh, you might want to pay a dividend where you've got a franking credit um, attached to it of 26 cents in the dollar. What does that mean? That means that uh, once, when the tax rate goes down, it means that's all you can attach to any future dividends. So it's been great that we've got this 30 cents in the dollar going down, um, as in our corporate rate has gone down to 26 this year, 30th of June. And then after that, it's going to be 25. That's fantastic. But if you're sort of a smaller business that, you know, pay yourself dividends, that means you have less franking credits that can be attached to that. So even though in the past you may have paid 30 cents and you've got all this uh, retained earnings sitting there waiting to be paid, uh, you only get 25% in the future attached or 26 if you pay it before 30th of June. Um, hope that's clear. So as I was saying um, before, um, companies, corporate rates, you've, you've got the 30 cents in the dollar. How do you get into the other the other um, lower rate. And it's basically saying, as I mentioned before, aggregated turnover, look at all your entities' turnovers in Australia and connected. Is it under or over 50 million? If it's under, uh, then potentially you can get these rates. What you have to watch out for is passive income, which I don't think you have to worry about in your line of business. Um, so probably not such a big issue. Um, and, you know, did you exist in the prior year? So these are just criteria, really. Um, but in most cases, your advisors would look at this when they're doing your tax returns, hopefully. Um, so what are the things, uh, the two topics that I really want to cover off is the temporary full expensing and the carry back of losses. So the temporary full expensing is a really great benefit um, if you don't already know it. Um, applies from the 6th of October. Why 6th of October? That was when the federal, federal budget was announced um, for 2021. So, and it goes to 30th of June, 2023. So the, um, the, the budget just recently that happened um, extended it to 2023. So that means you have from the 6th of October 2020 to the 30th of June 2023 to buy as many assets with any value as you like and you can claim it as a tax deduction. That's the simplest form of putting it. Now, um, there is some criteria about your turnover and, you know, whether if your turnover is um, over 50 million, uh, then it has to be new assets, but you could, you could buy secondhand assets if your turnover is under 50 million. So something to look at there, but it's really simple in the sense that um, it applies pretty much to all entities that have aggregated turnover of under 50 billion. So what do you mean by that? I mean, you got, you look at your Australian entity and you got to say, yeah, I'm well under 50 billion, um, sorry, 5 billion, not 50 billion. That'd be lovely. Um, and then you look at your overseas zone and, and some, you know, entities are, are subsidiaries of 
global entities um, and effectively, you know, might not apply to everyone, but their turnover could be in excess um, of 5 billion. Uh, but in most cases, it's well under 5 billion. So this rule pretty much applies, I think, to a lot of entities in Australia. Um, and there's no threshold limit to claiming. So effectively, you know, you want to buy um, a car, you want to buy, um, I don't know, a big plant, plant machinery, which costs you 500,000, you can claim it outright. And what's the strategy there? Why would you want to go and do that? And, you know, you're saying, Mariana, well, I just don't have the money to go and go out there and buy a machine worth 100,000. Um, and do you need a machine for 100,000? Um, if you're in the freight boarding industry, you may not have that much plant and equipment, but I'm sure your warehouse does have something. So you might have forklifts and so on. Um, so there will be some plant equipment. And why would you go and spend the money, even if you had the money? Well, I think the benefit is, is that one of the things that we'll, I'll, I'll talk about that maybe, and I'll let you hold that point for a minute. I just wanted to point this out and I'll go to the next slide and I'll come to my conclusion at the end. So what they've brought in as well is these carry back of losses. So what is, what is this big picture? Big picture is that, um, again, all entities with the turnover, aggregated turnover, meaning worldwide, is under 55, 5 billion. So that's quite a lot of entities and you're pretty much going to probably be in that unless it's a really big conglomerate. Um, what it's saying is that if you had a profit in one year and in the current year you have a loss, you could take that loss back, so tax affected, of course, and, and offset it against the tax that you paid in the past and get that money back. So it's a cash back, if you like. So it's quite a good incentive. So, you know, with COVID that hit, um, a lot of businesses, you know, didn't do so well. And they didn't do so well in when, when was it, you know. Um, you know, you might have had uh, profits in 2019, but in 2020, you know, you may have hit losses. And so this starts from that 2020 period, 30th of June 2020, or if you're a December year end, December 20, 2020 that is, um, you can effectively look at these and go, okay, well, I've got losses in this year, I'm going to carry them back and because I meet all the other criteria. And so if you go to the next slide, there is a bit of criteria outlined in one of these slides. So um, I'll, I'll go through the criteria in a minute. So my entity must have a loss. Now I've just started with the years, um, you know, 2020 and 2021, but I could have added there 2022, 2023. So any of one of those years, but let's stick to one year to make it very clear. So in my 2020 year, um, or let's say 2021, it's coming up now, I had a loss. Now, and then if I look at my liabilities, I could say that in my 19 year, I had a profit and maybe my 20, I had a profit, or maybe I had a loss in my 2020. Um, but I could go and carry the losses back to the the profit year. Now, obviously, if I've made a loss in 2019, 20 and 21, forget it, there's nothing there for you, right? But if I have made um, some profit in 2019, and I made a loss in 2020, I could potentially use these rules. Now, you may say, well, I've made a profit in 2019, Marianne, and I've made a profit in 2020, and I've made a profit in 2021, and I say, great, on, good on you. Um, and then you then might look in 2020, two or 23 and you might make a loss there. So then you could carry it back. Um, and you know, you might start with the 2020, 2019, use, use up the losses there, etc. cetera. Um, if you go to the next slide, what it's, it's sort of saying is that it, it goes back and reduces your losses. You have to look at your franking account um, and you must have had an earlier income tax. You must have had a liability. Um, in, pay tax in, in the past. So there is a bit of criteria around that, but it's not that hard to meet. Obviously, if your losses are greater than your profit or the tax that you paid on the profit, it'll only be to that extent that you paid tax, which is logical. Um, if you go to the next slide, I'm not sure if it's on this next slide. So um, what they're saying is that if your tax rate was 30 cents in the dollar, as we discussed, um, then you're, if you would look at your losses and you multiply that by 30 cents in the dollar and you offset it. So that's the amount that you will get back. So you'll get some money back from the business. Now, if you're a base rate entity, which we talked about before, the lower tax rate, 
which you all be aware of, then you again, you would offset your losses against that rate. So it's all accordingly and how you get your money back. Um, if you go to the next slide, oh no, maybe go back a slide. Sorry, I thought there was another one there. Um, the point of all this, if we go just back to the next, um, the carry back of losses, uh, the temporary write off um, slide, thank you. So what I wanted to point out here, um, if you were looking at, you know, that you wanna get your business back running, if you like, um, you might just have a bit of a plan and say, well, 2021, I really can't afford to buy any plant equipment. I'm gonna break even, or maybe I'm gonna make a slight loss. And then you can potentially, you know, use these rules to claw back some of that loss, meaning get some profit back. It's a cash flow thing. The only thing about it is that when do you get that money back? It's when you lodge your tax return. Um, so the sooner you lodge your tax return, I guess the sooner you get that back. So a bit of an incentive there. The only thing sometimes is like December year ends is availability of the actual software to go and lodge it straight away. And you, you then go down that path doing things manually and that can take you longer. So those things may delay you, but in, in essence, it's doing your tax return. Um, but one, I think the tax planning uh, that I think is, is beneficial and is legal as well. I mean, this is nothing, you know, um, there's nothing uh, credit crafty or anything like that. You're, you're, not, you're not doing anything sneaky. Is the, the rules allow it is that if you had the money or you could borrow the money um, to invest in, in getting some equipment that you may need for your business to get it running, um, you might want to spend that money um, and that expenditure would may put you into a loss position. And so that you could carry that loss back to a profit year. So all your ducks have to align, of course, you heard it would have had to make a lot, uh, profit in the prior year. Now this starts for the 30th of June, 2019 period. So if you make a profit in the 2018 period and you make losses thereon, this is not going to be useful for you. So I think it's, that's, a strategy probably to discuss with your um, advisors or ourselves um, is to just sort of see if this might be a benefit to you. Now, it may not be a benefit to you today, um, 30th of June, 2020 or December, 2020, but it could be a benefit to you. So this carries on to 30th of June, 2023. So you have some time to have a think about it and see if this is some strategy that is worth putting in. Now, it's only worth it if you, um, you know, need some assets for your warehouse or your business that you could use. Um, and obviously, if you if you've got if you've got trucks and planes and so on, um, you, if you're doing really well if you've got planes. <laughs> but if you've got something that's quite um, big and chunky and expensive, um, that could be a massive expense um, for your business. Obviously, you've got to have the money. But as I say, if you go and borrow the money and you know, and you've planned and you can get that money back, you can also, you know, pay for it with that refund. So all the things to think about. So they're the main things I just want to talk, touch on, on the budget. I think they were the more significant ones that are worth probably talking about. So I'm going to hand you back to Bill. Thanks. Thanks, Mariana. So just going back to now some employer considerations, um, uh, the, the super guarantee rate is to increase to 10% from 1st of July. There was some debate um, initially about whether that would happen, but it definitely is, has been legislated and has not been changed. So we'll go up from 1st of July and we'll, over time, next few years, we'll eventually get to 12% by 1st of July, 2025. So single touch payroll. So I think this is, this is quite a big area and we've had a lot of interest in this. Um, look, it's important to mention now, um, you know, especially for smaller family businesses, um, as we all know, you know, STP, it's, it's sort of like a reporting function between employers and the ATO and providing the ATO with wages information. <clears throat> and sort of STP is really reported in two steps. The first step is real-time reporting done each pay cycle, um, which a lot of you may be familiar with. And the second step is this, is this finalization declaration. I mean, the benefits, of course, as we know, there's no longer a requirement to pay to prepare annual payment summaries for staff. That's done automatically now. Um, it's all computerized. 
and there's no requirement to prepare a withholding payment summary report, which were all previously manual. Um, the, the main point here is for everyone to be aware that the finalization declaration, which um, goes to the ATO, has to be done by the 14th of July. Why I brought up single touch payroll, I just wanted to go through for small employers. Um, you know, most companies should be using STP already. If you're not using it, um, you may need to contact your accountant for assistance. Um, uh, however, smaller employers were granted a later start date and certain concessions. And this, this sort of last group of employers is what they call closely held payees. And what's a closely held payee? Well, it's basically a company that only employs family members and have no external employees. Um, these concessions are, they had a delayed onboarding, but, but now they have to start rejoin the program from 1st of July, 21. <clears throat> um, and we have been setting up quite a few of these companies. Basically, they need to be set up on some form of payroll system. Um, they, the, the other concessions they have is they have three ways of reporting the STP information. The first option is just to report it like other companies report the actual payments, um, just like everybody else. The second option is they can make actual reporting quarterly. Uh, and the third option is they can uh, report a reasonable estimate quarterly. So when, when we say that, what's an estimate, a reasonable estimate is equal to greater equal to or greater than 25% of the wages, payments and tax withheld from the previous year across, across each quarter. So those concessions are not allowable for a normal company. And we have been setting up quite a few of these uh, smaller entities and even other companies which haven't yet gone into the STP system. But from 1st of July, really, I think every company who employs staff has to be on STP. Okay, the job maker hiring credit. Now, I haven't really seen many companies take advantage of this yet. Um, and because of the conditions, I think, that apply to it. But, but anyway, it's something to be aware of. So it's basically available to um, eligible employers over a 12 month period, which started from the 7th of October, 2020. For each new additional job they created. Um, so they would be entitled to receive, the employer is entitled to receive $2,200 per week if they hire somebody aged between 16 and 29. And they're entitled to $100 per week if they hire someone eligible aged between 30 and 35. So if you're over 35 like us, you know, there's, there's no concessions for us. Um, but the, the new employee though um, must, one of the conditions, there are a few conditions, the, the new employee must increase the overall employee headcount and payroll. Uh, and the employee must have worked for a minimum of 20 hours per week. And probably the biggest, the biggest sort of setback for this is that they have to have received, received certain welfare payments for three months uh, before employment. So they, they really had to have been on job, I think it was job seeker uh, or a uh, you know, parenting allowance or something like that, some sort of welfare payment to be eligible. So I think that sort of cuts out a few people. But, um, but I haven't seen a lot of that, a lot of that um, being taken up. So I, th I thought I'd also mention this new regime coming in for directors uh, called Directors identification numbers. Um, so recent announcements have been made to introduce a, a DIN requirement, um, and, but it's from a date yet to be sort of announced. Um, so generally new, new appointed direct, newly appointed directors will be required to have a DIN before their appointment. Um, it still hasn't come in as law yet though, so it's, um, 
I think they're still doing some consultations around it. I mean, the legislation is out there, but it definitely hasn't been passed. Um, there are some traditional uh, transitional arrangements, um, uh, which provide for an extra 20 days for a director to apply for a DIN during the first year of operation. Um, for existing directors, there's really no requirement to apply for the DIN until the, you know, the legislation, you know, is actually actually comes into comes into effect. So I think th there's this draft instrument which is around at the moment, which is out, and it sort of focuses on these transitional periods uh, the directors will have to apply for. Um, so existing directors, for existing directors, they'll have really up till 30th of November. 23 to apply for a DIN. For new directors, they'll have until 30th of November 22. But, but uh, you know, as I said, you know, there's at the moment there's no action required. It's more for information purposes. Um, and um, you know, once the legislation has been brought in and is operational, then we'll provide uh, more information on that. I thought I might just also touch on some individual considerations. Um, and, 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 I, and I suppose if you're looking to make personal contributions for 30th of June, 20, before 30th of June 21, there are a few sort of reminders to be conscious of. Um, so especially those between 67 and 74 years of age, if they wanna make a contribution a tax deductible contribution for 21 year, they still have to meet a works test. A work test, and this work test requires that you're employed for at least 40 hours during a 30 day period. Um, for everyone else, you know, you've, we've got the, the $25,000 limit current cap, um, and that cap's increasing to 27 and a half thousand from 1st of July. Um, so, but, and there's also these non-concessional caps and what a non-concessional contribution is, is, these are contributions made from after tax income. So the indiv individual doesn't, has already paid tax on the, on the amount contributed and they don't get a tax deduction for the money going in into the super fund. But it's a, it's a good way to, to obviously boost up your super fund balance, especially approaching you know, retirement. <clears throat> and that will be indexed uh, to 110,000 uh, from, the, from the 1st of July, you know, 2021. So also from the first, this is called the unused concessional caps carry forward rule. So, so from the 1st of July, you can roll forward any unused uh, concessional uh, superannuation contributions. So in, in one year, if you don't use the full amount of your $25,000, you can carry this forward to a future year. So for example, in the, say in the 2020 year, uh, you made a super contribution of uh, $20,000. Um, in the 21 year, what you could do, obviously you're allowed a $25,000 cap, but you can also add, you can also contribute an extra 5,000 for the amount in the previous year that, um, you know, the carry forward amount from the previous year. So in the 21 year, you can actually contribute $30,000. So, and, and that can be made, you know, as, as, a, as a personal contribution. So you know, your employer may have been putting in a certain amount, you know, and to top it up, you can actually put in a, uh, your own, what they call personal contributions, you know, to get you up to either 25,000 or the 30,000 I mentioned in my example. However, you know, and again, it's a useful concession for people approaching retirement and want to contribute a bit more into super. There are some basic, some, Basic conditions, though, um, you know, in the 2021 year, 
um, they can only use, you can only use your unused cap uh, going back to 19, nine, sorry, 2019 or 2020 years. Can't go further than that. And also you must have a super balance below 500,000 as well. So that's, that's important. And once five years, if you haven't used the, uh, the superannuation contribution in your prior years, after five years, uh, they expire. Um, but I suppose that the main advice with super, you know, it's, it's important to try and maximize if you, you know, maximize your contributions and even top up your employer, con you know, the employer contributions with a, with a private contribution uh, prior to year end. <clears throat> okay, I think that concludes our presentation, Steve. <clears throat> Thanks, Bill. We'll now open the session to question and question time. So, yeah, and Steve, I'd probably be interested in asking um, those viewing um, if if they do have an opinion as do they think that in this industry, um, the temporary right, the full write off, you know, of expenditure, that concession is a good concession for that industry, or maybe they think, oh, it's not really of any use to us. Um, I do say that most in this industry probably are making profits, so you know losses may not be may not be a big thing in their own right, like without having something to push it down, if you like. So that'd be interesting mm. for those that um, you know can answer that question. That'd be that getting your views. That'd be good. Absolutely. Yes, we've had a lot of questions, Steve, on especially your cars, um, uh, you know, uh, cars have been a big focus area. A lot of people have been querying whether cars can uh, also, you know, can attract the, the rules, you know, so for example, if you buy a $50,000 car, can we get a write off mm -hmm. for that up front? And, and the answer is yes, but obviously um, you need to take into account the, the private, if there's, if there's a private, percentage usage, like if the private percentage usage is 10%, mm -hmm. then you can only write off, you know, 90% of the car, you know, in that, in, in the current year. Mm -hmm. um, but it is, but it is allowable, yes. <clears throat> um, all right, it seems like we have um, our first question. Um, so it is, can purchasing property for business purposes get instant tax write-off? Yeah, good question. No, not if you're buying a house. <laughs> so that's what you mean by property. But if you mean property by some people consider computer property, um, but no, not. Uh, and I think the question is referring to property as a house and so on. So no, so, the, it does exclude. It's what is a depreciating asset hmm. under the legislation, if that is a better way to define it. So um, land and buildings, I suppose, wouldn't, cap wouldn't be captured then, Mariana? Yeah, that's right. They'd yep. be excluded as depreciating yep. assets. Okay. Whereas a car would be included. But I, I like the question. <laughs> it's, 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 a it's a good question. one. <laughs> I did say everything. So, you know, that was a bit deceiving. <laughs> um, I mean, they, 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 they'd be entitled, you know, there might be other concessions, other building, concessions. building write offs yep. and things, but uh, over a period of time, you know, usually, usually like a. a um, um, but yeah, but not, not an instant nice. Yeah, it's more like 4% or 2.5%. 2.5%, it's not really, yeah, it's not really that, that industry, industrial properties are the 4%, but really not that, you know, not a killer on the tax return. Mm. <laughs> but, but, it, but it could it could be that the business property, though, it could be um, the purchase of that property could be set up in a certain way. There, there could be some benefits in, you know, putting it into another, type of entity whether so you you typically keep that property outside the business entity so you, you might set up you buy it in your own name or buy it in a trust name for example and, and then you could charge um you know a, a rental to the business with a bit of a markup um so you could get a you know a little bit of a benefit a benefit that way um mm. so you might want to put that into a separate a separate entity, business entity, which makes sense from an asset protection point in any case, having the business property outside the main operating business. 
Um, so, or, or in the super fund, there yeah, can be also purchased the business property if there's sufficient of the funds in the, well, the business property can be purchased by the super fund. And I mean, super fund can borrow too, to buy that. Um, mm. so, um, so there are a few options you know, available, um, but they wouldn't get an instant asset write-off, <laughs> unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, it looks like um, there's no further questions. So having said that, um, I would like to thank our panellists, um, being Mariana and Bill. And Steve, I'd like to thank HLB Man Judd, yourself, Steve, Bill and Mariana for presenting today's uh, insightful session. Thank you very much. Thanks, Harris. And thanks, everyone, for, for joining us. Uh, this concludes our webinar. We hope to see you next time.